Welcome to First Thursdays. Thank you all so much for being here. This is one of the um, fun First Thursdays we have. And pun intended, it's always buzzing around. Thank you. Um, anyway, thank you so much for being here. Again, you're at First Thursdays with the same old Tulsa. And we, uh, it's an exciting one. If you're into butterflies, this is the place to be. And uh, first, I want to thank our sponsors. I want to give a uh, thank you to PSO, our lead sponsor. Give a wave, Carrie. Thank you so much for, your, for sponsoring us all these years. And also want to give a thank to Cavanta and TCC Center for Creativity, PSO Wind Choice, Grog's Green Barn, One Oak, and Save Our Streams. Let's give them all a round of applause for their support. Because truly, they are helping to make this program continue on. So we really appreciate that. I also want to thank my board members that are here today, Mike Lemus, James Williams, Pam Taylor, Carrie Rowland, and Stephanie Cameron. If you could give a wave, and let's say thank you to them as well for their leadership. I want to thank my team, which is Sarah Hicks and Jill Maud, and our newest team member, which is Megan Hurley. She's back there by the Milkweed. She's our new events coordinator. Woo! Give her, a, go by and say hello, introduce yourselves. We're super excited to have her on the team. So uh, make, make a point to say hello. Uh, also want to uh, thank Full Sun Composting for helping to compost our events here. They actually have a booth today, but they also have their composting uh, bins here for us. And then thanking uh, TCC for their recycling uh, for today's event. And those are also by the exits there. Uh, our next first Thursday will be by Julie Sky, and it'll be on the sustainable development goals. So it should be really interesting. We'll be digging into those, and she's been doing a lot of research on that, so we're super excited to have her present, and that will be here uh, next month at the Center for Creativity. And then next week, we have our B2B case for sustainability series, and that will be on solar and battery technology. We'll be at TU, so that's on the 9th, and that's from 8 to 10, and it it's going to be very, uh, we're excited about that. So we're going to hear from Francis Solar on solar energy. We're going to hear from Spire's new technologies on battery technology. And then we'll have a representative from TU that will be able to show their solar panels. And if you sign up in time, you can go on uh, a tour to see those panels. So um, very, and we'll also have some of our members will have booth space there as well. So it's a very engaging event. And so we hope that you can join us for that. And that's the B2B case for sustainability series. There's some information at the sign-in booth if you uh, need some more information on that. Our recharge, our second annual fundraising uh, fundraiser will be September 21st at Kane's Ballroom. So if you're interested in being a part of that this year, please uh, come up and visit with me or one of the team members. We'd love to talk to you about it. Um, and, you know, thank you for being here and being a part of uh, supporting Sustainable Tulsa and First Thursdays, because if you weren't here to hear what Jane has to say, then we wouldn't have a reason for being here. So thank you for making the time uh, to come and learn and to educate yourself and your teams, because I see a couple scorecard teams around sustainability. I think it's, uh, it's how we will move our community forward is that level of engagement. So thank you very much for that. Um, our scorecard members, I know we talk about it a bit, but it's our uh, triple bottom line strategy for our business members. Sarah Hicks is the scorecard coordinator back there. There she is. So if you're interested in scorecard, she's uh, the person to talk to about it. We also have several of our scorecard members. If you're a scorecard member or a coach or an advisor, please put your hand up. These folks are making Tulsa more sustainable. And many of them have way stations, or they're putting them in this year. Uh, I know One Oak just put one in. Um, they're also offering uh, seed mix to some of the landowners where their lines are going. So they're educating uh, opportunities for the uh, landowners. Um, I think uh, we have way station. Do we have way station over there at Muscogee Creek Nation? Whoop! And uh, the zoo and. Yes, Spirit Air System just put theirs in, and I think, uh, Stephanie, your group's putting yours in next or Saturday, so woo. So uh, lots of way stations are going in. Uh, I know there's several people that chatted with me that are interested in doing it again this year, and every little bit of milkweed helps. So 
Today we have milkweed for everyone. Uh, it's one per person, and we'll, we'll give that out at the end and just make a commitment to actually plant it. I know it gets exciting to see plants, and then sometimes they shrivel up and or never get in the ground. So just make sure if you take one, you actually plant it. Uh, we appreciate it, and Grog Screen Barn helped to bring those uh, for us today. So um, there's several flyers on your table. Uh, we'll pass the mic in a little bit uh, to our booth goers, but I know there's one on Crow Creek Meadow, uh, a sign dedication day, and it has a monarch and pollinators garden. That's happening, I think, uh, and there's some flyers also at the sign in. Uh, there was also another uh, monarchs on the mountain. There's some flyers at Okies for Monarchs. They have more information about that. That's in September. It's another great educational event. So lots of things going on. Um, we'll post out on uh, Facebook to kind of keep you updated with some of those things. But anyway, thank you so much for being here. And now we're going to get to hear from one of um, the community is lucky to have Jane. as She's a treasure to the community when it comes to understanding uh, butterflies and promoting that. Uh, Jane Breckenridge is uh, the co-director of the Tribal Environmental Action from Monarchs, which is called TEAM, which partners with Monarch Way Watch and seven Native American tribes to restore monarch habitat on tribal lands in Oklahoma, and the Tribal Alliance for Pollinators, which is called TAP, which is bringing together cutting-edge scientific protocols calls for monarch and pollinator habitat restoration and traditional ecological knowledge to create a new model for conservation collaboration. Ms. Breckenridge is the director of the Uchi Butterfly Farm located in Leonard, Oklahoma, and has spent the last 20 years raising and exhibiting butterflies throughout the United States and Canada, as well as providing communities and youth education on butterflies. She founded the Natives Raising Natives Project in 2013, which is teaching rural tribal members to be butterfly farmers in order to reduce unemployment, promote science education for Native youth, and raise awareness of the need for protecting the fragile ecosystem ecosystem that supports butterflies and other threatened pollinators. We're thrilled to have Jane. Please help me welcome Jane. Worthy. There you go. There we go. Okay. Well, thank you. Okay. Can you hear? Yes. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. And um, I'm thrilled to be here for a lot of reasons. First of all, I just, I love to uh, try and convince people what they can do to support monarch habitat. Always happy to have that invitation. But also, uh, I'm happy to be here at TCC. My mother taught at TCC for 20 years. She was a nursing instructor, and uh, back in, starting back in the old TJC days. And uh, just to see how it's grown, it's, it's really wonderful. And I, it is really one of the crown jewels, I think, that we have of Tulsa that does not get uh, recognized enough. So I'm thrilled to be here. And also, this is a very cool new building, so I had not been here before either. So. Um, yeah, so I'm the director of the Yuchi Butterfly Farm. Um, so the first question I always get is, what is a butterfly farm? Is that even a real thing? Because it doesn't sound like it's a real thing. It sounds like a hippie hobby, which is totally something I would do, but, uh, but it's also a real venture. So uh, butterfly farming accounts for about $70 million to the U.S. economy every year. Uh, it is, it's a real form of agriculture. So we raise butterflies, native species of butterflies, which then go to zoos, exhibits, uh, they go for education in schools, we do some with releases. Uh, we've got a big one coming up with Integris uh, Health for their cancer survivors event. Um, so they bring in uh, 800 cancer survivors and then they all release a butterfly, a painted lady butterfly at the end and uh, out in the, the gardens anyway. So we, we do stuff like that, work with the hospice. Uh, butterflies have a lot of meaning for people, I think, yes. Um, so, uh, so we, um, okay, losing my train of thought, I was wandering off to Integris there. Uh, so, um, our farm is also, as she said, the home to the Natives Raising Natives Project. And that's something we started, uh, I guess back in 2013, it's been a while now, to provide employment for uh, Creek citizens through butterfly farming. Um, it's based on a program that we'd worked with for many years down in Costa Rica. Um, in addition to being butterfly farmers, we are butterfly exhibitors. Uh, if you've been to like the Tulsa State Fair and seen that giant tent with the butterflies in it or Oklahoma State Fair, that's, that's ours. Um, 
So we've worked with them for a long time, uh, supporting indigenous employment and rainforest conservation down in Costa Rica. Uh, but at somewhere along the way, my husband said, you know, um, we have a lot of indigenous people right here in Oklahoma, and you know, there's something we could be doing to help people here. So we launched this program. Uh, we provide all the training and supplies for Creek citizens, um, particularly south of I-40 and um, the southern part of the Creek Nation, to raise butterflies on their own lands. Uh, there are three goals with this program. Uh, the first is obviously to provide employment, to increase employment opportunities, particularly out there in rural Oklahoma where we all know we need more of it, and it's sustainable, eco-friendly employment. Uh, the second is to increase science learning opportunities. Again, uh, school funding gets cut all the time, and this is a great way for kids to engage with a hands-on science learning project. Even the most indifferent learner gets pretty excited when you give them caterpillars and butterflies to learn with. Um, and the third thing, though, um, that is probably the most important reason we do this is to raise awareness of the need to conserve native butterflies uh, and the ecosystems that support them. So one of the things we've seen is just like when we are trying to promote education um, to youth, native youth using caterpillars and butterflies, and it changes people to interact with them. The same thing happens with people as well. So I can talk about habitat conservation and the need for it and threatened species and blah, 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 and uh, people glaze over. But when people are in one of our exhibits or our educational programs and they're actually interacting, holding, um, feeding, because we let people feed the butterflies at the Q-tip, and the, anyway, people really like that. But when people actually interact with these native butterflies and they see up close and personal how beautiful they are, how magnificent they are, it, it changes things for people. And all of a sudden, what one moment was sort of an academic argument that seemed like somebody else's problem about habitat destruction and, and loss of species uh, it gets personalized. Because when you're looking at this really, really amazing, beautiful butterfly and you tell people in 10 years, 20 years, these may be gone from our world. You know, your children will not know them. Your grandchildren won't know them. Um, you know, it's 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 a message. It changes people. So, um, for us to be able to raise these native butterflies in a sustainable way and to use them as ambassadors to get people excited about habitat conservation is is a powerful thing. So, the farm um, we're located on my great grandmother's original um, Creek allotment. She was Uchean Creek. I am an enrolled citizen of the Creek Nation, uh, and. Um, so with, uh, I am like, I am really off my game today, sorry. So, but with the Natives Raising Natives, the, the thing that we really started focusing on uh, back in 2014 was the monarch butterfly and monarch conservation. Let's see if this is ready to go. There we go. Um, you all know that the monarchs are in trouble. I don't think you'd be here if you hadn't heard about that. Um, but, but they are. The, the crisis is real and it's big. Uh, so just in terms of thinking about the scale of this, uh, in 1996, over 900 million monarch butterflies made the journey down to Mexico to the overwintering grounds. Uh, by the fall of 2013, that number was down to 33 million. Um, think about that. It's, it's, it's staggering when you really contemplate uh, just the, the, the size of the problem and, and what we're losing there. So this is a, over a 90% decline. And they are currently under review uh, by uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for production as a, an endangered or threatened species. So, um, so just to think about where these numbers are going um, and to look at, at the graph, uh, you can see we actually, this year we, we did a little better. We got really lucky. Uh, the weather all cooperated. We had perfect best case scenario population uh, weather supporting uh, milkweed conditions. And even so, we still only got up to about 300 million butterflies. Uh, numbers are, you know, we see little blips, but uh, they're continuing to trend downwards. And um, so it's, it, it, the, 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 the crisis really is real. So, um, so why are they disappearing? Why, where, where, how do, you, how do you lose 800 million monarchs? You know, where did they all go? And like so many other species at risk, uh, it really, it all boils down to habitat. Uh, it's, it's, this is a habitat question. It's, yes, the population numbers are disappearing, but they are disappearing because the habitat does not exist anymore to support these butterflies. Um, so with thinking about, okay, so if you're, if you are, if you're a monarch and you're highly mobile, if you can fly 3,000 miles, how does habitat loss really affect you? So to think about that, you really need to go back to fourth grade science for a minute and think about the monarch butterfly life cycle. 
every monarch, every, every butterfly, every moth has four distinct life stages. Um, they, they start out life as an egg, they move to a caterpillar, a larva, and then on to a chrysalis, and adult butterfly. Uh, when they are in the caterpillar stage of their, of their life cycle, the only plant that the monarch butterfly can eat is milkweed. Um, so just put it simply, uh, you know, if you have no milkweed, you have no monarchs. Um, so as milkweed has gotten erratic, it's, it gets a very bad rap. I mean, you know, it's unfortunate. With the weed in its name, I mean, you know, people, uh, they don't like the milkweed. But it's, it's a lovely native prairie plant. It's, it's quite beautiful. But, uh, but it has just been decimated. It's been absolutely decimated. Um, uh, and so to get things back up to a sustainable level, uh, the very best scientific minds say that we need to restore 1.6 billion stems of milkweed. So it is, it is a large scale thing that we have to do here. Um, so how do, how do we need 1.6 billion with a B stems of milkweed? You know, again, like the monarchs, you know, where, where did that all that go? How did we lose that that quickly? And, you know, and that's, part of it's drought, uh, but a lot of it's just because humans, humans, we screwed it up. Uh, we overused herbicide, we put in rampant development uh, without thinking about what the, the consequences would be for the animals and the plants that live there. Uh, every year still we're losing over a million acres of monarch habitat just to development. 18 million acres was taken out of the conservation reserve program. Um, you know, after particularly this the timing of this is coincidental, but uh, you can't prove the link, but at the time that the advent of the GMO crops started to come in and after the uh, re uh, renewable fuel standard, the ethanol, the ethanol initiative came in, um, corn went up over $10 a bushel. Everybody in the upper Midwest went nuts with trying to get as much production as they could. And, and it happened to unfortunately time with uh, when the GMO crops, Roundup Ready crops were coming in. So you had all this land's coming out of uh, conservation programs and into corn production. At the same time, you had people doing aerial spraying of, of glyphosate, of Roundup. And if you've ever been up there in the upper Midwest and seen it in the summer, it's, it's terrifying. I mean, they literally are up just, you know, doing it. So those areas that used to support monarchs, um, they couldn't just, and so you had, you had too much herbicide, you had too much land going into that production. At the same time, you had development, you had a bad drought, you had a lot of bad things happen. But um, but it, it all comes back to us, and it's going to be to us to fix it as well. So, um, which brings perhaps to a larger question, uh, is, is why does this matter? And, and why do I care? And why should you care? Uh, this, this is a scary world right now, and there's just a heck of a lot of terrifying things, as we all know. Um, everywhere at home, in Oklahoma, abroad, you know, um, it's, it's, a, it's a scary time. And we're talking about a little butterfly. But it does matter a lot to everyone in this room, and there are three very important reasons why. So the first one is that the monarch is a part of what is widely regarded as one of the greatest natural phenomena on Earth. Uh, the, the migration, there is nothing else like it. Uh, scientists are uh, you know, it's, scientists don't, still don't even understand how this happens. Every year you've got these butterflies, hundreds of millions of them, up to, you know, over 900 million of them, uh, that overwinter down in Mexico at the overwintering grounds and clusters. It's a small area, uh, just about, well, depending on the year, uh, you know, less than 10 acres most years. Uh, so you've got hundreds of millions of butterflies there. And in the, in the spring, they're going to move up north, you know, starting about Valentine's Day, they're going to become active and they're going to start moving north, come up to Oklahoma and Texas, lay their eggs, and then subsequent generations are going to continue to push north um, through about mid-June and then they stay put. And then come, they, more generations are born. And then in mid-August, starting up in Canada, then these butterflies are going to return. And again, these are hundreds of millions of butterflies we're talking about. And so these butterflies are going to fly from as far away as Canada down to Mexico. And they're all going to, the migration is the angle of the sun declines. It's going to trigger that instinct in them. And they're going to start heading down there. Uh, so the really cool part about this, I mean, the fact that you've got, you know, hundreds of millions of butterflies, like, flying, you know, uh, you know across the country. And they could even fly up to 3,000 miles. If you think about how fragile they are, that in and of itself is pretty dang cool. But... But the really, really miraculous part of it is these butterflies are going to their ancient overwintering grounds 
which again, as I, as I said, they are very small. Um, they're just a few acres in totality. And all these butterflies at the same time are gonna find their way there and not a single butterfly on that migration has ever been there before. Their great grandparents left six or eight months earlier, but these butterflies, from our perspective, they don't know where they're going. They're not where they're, they don't know where they're going, and so somehow they're going to manage to navigate across a continent, all of them, to wind up at the same place at the same time. And this isn't like an easy-to-find location. This is up in the transvolcanic mountain range. It's up above 10,000 feet in elevation. These fir trees, it's, it's difficult to find and get there, yet they make their way there every year since time immemorial. Um, Scientists don't know how they do it. I mean, you know, a miracle, you know, that works for me. I mean, I think we can go with that. Uh, so, so here we have this great treasure and this great miracle, and we're on the verge of losing it because, because we were careless or we were lazy or it just wasn't important to us. And, and I think that's something that we all need to, to reconsider because I, I don't want a world without the monarch migration. I don't want, that's, I don't want to hand that down and be the, you know, the generation that lost that. So the second reason that's perhaps even more important, though, than that is what's going on with the monarchs is the canary in the coal mine for what's going on with all of the pollinators. And we notice when we lose 900 million big orange and black pretty butterflies, but all those other pollinators are disappearing just as quickly, and nobody's watching and nobody's paying attention. Pollinators matter. You hear people talk about it a lot. It's a buzzword, but it really, really matters to all of us. 70% of all plants on Earth require pollination to exist. 30% of all agricultural crops. These pollinators are part of delicate, fragile ecosystems that will collapse as you pull things out. They're, they're symbiotic and fragile and delicate relationships. And what's happening to the monarchs is happening to all the pollinators, and it ought to concern all of us a great deal. So the third reason is that, let's see, as Oklahomans, we bear special responsibility on this. This is the Monarch Recovery Plan. Um, you, can, you all can see what's right in the middle of that red bullseye. Um, it's Oklahoma. That's, that's the critical zone for saving the monarch. And not our, only are we in the critical zone, we are the area in the critical zone with the most badly degraded habitat. Um, after the Great Dust Bowl, most of Oklahoma went through what they call grassland conversion. So all of our beautiful native prairies that supported all sorts of biodiversity and wildlife were replaced with Bermuda and fescue, which is great if you're a horse or a cow. It kind of pretty much sucks if you're anybody else. So, uh, so we need to get out there and we need to restore. We need to, we need to fix this as Oklahomans and, and realize you know, that the fate of the monarchs rests in our hands. So the good news is, uh, with all the doom and gloom, is it, it's not too late and, and we can. We can turn this around, but it's going to take all of us coming together and acting. So um, the easiest thing anybody can do, and seriously, anybody can do this, is plant a milkweed and just save a monarch. And there's no excuse because we're giving away milkweeds here today. So uh, you really, really have no excuse. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Grogs and Sustainable Tulsa for supplying those. So um, with a milkweed, Again, um, they're beautiful, they're a beautiful native plant. So uh, they're, they make it, they're nice ornamentals. And so one of the other things about, to remember about milkweed is that it is not just about monarchs anymore, it's also a great support plant for all the pollinators. It's highly nectiferous, and when it is in bloom, it's preferred uh, over anything else that's in bloom in a prairie landscape uh, for, for pollinators of all sorts, even hummingbirds nectar on it. So uh, it's, it's a lovely, beautiful plant that does not get enough respect and also will help save the butterflies. So uh, how beautiful is it? It's really beautiful, okay? It's so gorgeous. So that's green antelope horn milkweed, Asclepius viridis, which is the most common um, milkweed in our part of Oklahoma and the most important one for monarch reproduction. Um, it's, uh, it's beautiful. So true story, uh, we were having a family party last year and, and my cousin went out and she's like a designer. She has a degree even in design, went out to pick the wildflowers to make the you know farm table thing, anyway. Uh, she came back and she had this in there. That, not that one, that's for a different picture, but she had milkweed in there. I said, oh, did you do that for me? And she said, no, what are you talking about? She just thought it was so pretty. She wanted it in the bouquet. So anyway, uh, it's, it's lovely. Uh, okay, and then we have uh, swamp milkweed. 
uh, Asclepius incarnata, which is again a really showy. Uh, it's it's a really showy plant, and so with that one, it's got to have a little bit more of a uh, wet feet. Uh, it does well in riparian habitats along streams, but it, it's also a nice one to put. Um, you know, if you've got a garden spot that's damp, uh, even. We were doing some like restoration work with the Morris Indian community, and they had a spot in their flower bed underneath the window air conditioner. It was dripping water all the time. So we, we put this one milkweed there. So anyway, you can use it all sorts of different ways. Um, we have, uh, this is uh, common milkweed, which unfortunately is not too common in Oklahoma anymore. Uh, we used to have it in northeastern Oklahoma, but after the bad drought years, um, 2012, 2013, a lot of it got eliminated. Uh, but it's, again, very beautiful. The, the smell of that is just, uh, it, is, it is so aromatic and lovely. It's it just, when it's blooming, it, it's just perfumey. Um, and that is the most important milkweed for monarchs in the upper Midwest. That's what they primarily use as their uh, host plant. And we have uh, Asclepius tuberosa, the, the butterfly milkweed, uh, which is lovely. It's a good pollinator plant, but it's actually not that great for monarch reproduction. So not to, some milkweed is better than, you know, no milkweed, uh, but if you're trying to just really help the, the larvae, it's, it's not high protein enough, technically. Uh, although they will in the flowers. Okay, and then um, we've got uh, tropical milkweed, Asclepius carasavica, uh, which is not native. Uh, you should not plant it out in your restoration projects. Uh, we do use it in our, in our little garden projects because a lot of things like to nectar on it. So then we just cut it back at the end of the year. And you can see there they are doing what they do, eating those, uh, those leaves. So that's some caterpillars eating um, the green antelope horn milkweed leaves. So, and that's, not, that's, that's at the farm too. That's not, you won't really probably get that exactly in your, in your garden, but they look cute. And, and then there we go there. So, um, so anybody, anybody, besides planting milkweed, anybody ought to be able to put in a butterfly garden. This is not that hard. So uh, number one rule, and this is an easy one, no pesticide. Uh, you know, you think that that would be obvious, but I can't tell you how many times I've had people come up to me at exhibits and say, oh, I've got a butterfly garden, but nothing's in there. It's like, are, are you spraying? Only the bad bugs. Well, it doesn't work like that, you know? So. These aren't, anyway, um, they're, they're poison, and, they're, and they, they kill the good bugs, too. So, uh, so several things with that. Um, first of all, don't spray it there yourself. Uh, watch out if you're in an area that's going to get a, little, a lot of drift. Uh, you know, be careful with that. But one of the other important things is look out for the neonics, the neonicotinoids, uh, which are a systemic, long-acting pesticide, and so many plants are treated with that. So that's why you should go someplace like Grog's or the farmer's market, uh, or if you're buying at one of the big major nurseries, make sure and ask if you, the plants have been treated with the neonics. Um, uh, some of these can have a half-life of up to 14 years. So when I say long-lasting, I'm not kidding. So uh, you don't want to bring in the butterflies and then kill them, because that would be bad karma. So all right, so butterfly garden basics. Uh, sunny area. Um, you, these, most of the plants that support butterflies and pollinators, they need a lot of full sun. So you want to look for at least six hours per day minimum. Eight would be better. Um, also want to think about, because we want to uh, think about supporting, supporting wildlife all through the season. So you've got to plan for continuous bloom. Uh, if you're using native plants, which is what we encourage you to do, because they are more nectar rich and they're better adapted to support these uh, you know, pollinators and butterflies, uh, a lot of those, the cultivars, the, the showy ornamentals, you know, uh, they aren't. They're, they're genetically modified to be pretty and to stay pretty and to actually resist pests, and we don't want that. We want to go the other direction. So um, if you're planting natives, you need to think about bloom times. So, uh, you know, you've got your spring bloom your early summer bloomers, midsummer, um, all the way on through. Uh, you want to plant those in clusters. It makes it easier for the butterflies to find them if you can plant them in like three to seven plants. And you want, if you can, to plant in a location protected from wind, which sounds kind of silly because, my goodness, again, with the flying 3,000 miles. But uh, if they're having to, when they're nectaring, if they're having to, uh, sh you know, fight off the wind and try and stabilize against that, that's energy they should be using for other things like uh, reproduction, for instance. So uh, every, every organism, an organism has a finite budget for time and energy, and we want to make sure they use it as well as possible. 
So uh, also, if you can include a water source, uh, butterflies, pollinators, they all do like water too. Uh, a, a muddy puddling area, you may have seen that, particularly live in the country. Um, the male butterflies will go in on the mud and they will try and uh, they will extract salt and other nutrients from that. So um, it looks kind of gross, but it's important if you're a butterfly. Uh, you want, if you can, to have a flat rock in full sun so that they can warm up on chilly mornings using uh, the heat there. And, uh, and as I said earlier, you want to use native species of plants. Um, they're, you know, is a benefit. They're also drought resistant, so that's a, a good thing. Um, and, you know, native plants, they're harder to find, but they are the ones that best support our pollinators and our butterflies. Okay, so if you're going to upgrade from there, you know, and I hope you will, to create a, a real official monarch waste station. Um, so the, the guidelines, they, they aren't really that tough. So think about everything I just told you, but then, then a little bit more. So to create an official monarch waste station, uh, it's a minimum of 100 square feet. However, that can be split up between several different locations and your same site. So, uh, you know, if you don't have contiguous, you know, 10 by 10 or whatever, uh, you can do a little patch here, a little patch there, a little patch, and then, you know, your entire yard or your, you know, business yard or whatever can be uh, considered the waste station. Again, um, you've got to make sure that you have the sun, the full sun, six to eight hours a day. Um, and thinking about shelter, about installing the plants close together, and that's a windbreak if you don't have a natural windbreak there. And, and you want to make them close, but not so close that the plants are being stressed. So follow the directions on uh, making sure for that species what the adequate growth, growth range is going to be. Um, for your official monarch waste station, you're going to need a minimum of 10 milkweed plants. Uh, Monarch Watch recommends at least two species. However, if you're planting more than 10 plants uh, of milkweed, uh, then it's okay, you can go with one. So that's, there's a loophole in that. So uh, with nectar plants, again, with the continuous blooming, and uh, besides just the continuous blooming, also try to be very aware of when the monarchs are gonna be coming through in the spring and the fall, because those are particularly important times. You wanna make sure that you've gotta be plant, you want plants to be in full bloom. Because again, these monarchs, they're flying an awfully long way, and when they come through Oklahoma, they've got to be able to find these nectar sources to be able to fuel up. So monarchs are one of the only animals, maybe the only animal, that has to gain weight on the migration because they're going to live on those fat reserves all winter long. Um, so if they, if they go into their overwintering period down in Mexico depleted and without good energy sources, then they're going to die over the winter. So, uh, you know, and they all funnel through, right, through Oklahoma. So again, this is why it's so important that we, we step up to the plate and do this. Um, okay, and then ongoing management, again, with the pesticide. I'm sorry, I'm going to keep on driving that point home, but it's one of the problems that got us here in the first place. So uh, please don't use pesticide in your way station. And also control the non-native invasives, because if you've got Johnson grass or a bunch of Bermuda or whatever that's going to come in there and choke out all your little native plants and your milkweeds, then um, you, you know, you've got to plan ahead of time. It's easier to keep it from coming in than to get rid of it once it's in there. And last of all, don't forget to register your Monarch Way Station, because that lets everybody know what we're doing here in Oklahoma and that we're, you know, we're making an effort. So. Um, and so you can just do that at, at uh, Monarch Watch, and there's the uh, address. It's easy to find on the Monarch Watch website. Um, so think about nectar plants. Uh, these are some of the ones we use at the farm. Not all of them are native, but they're all ones that are easy to grow. So uh, I also have, because Sandy Schwinn was supposed to be your real speaker today, and I'm just the substitute teacher, so to speak, and, but she provided handouts, and so when you leave today, make sure and ask for them. I think they've got them at the front um, with a list of uh, recommended plant species for your waste station, and so she's got a more detailed list and also a list of host plants for different kinds of caterpillars. So um, see, these are just, again, some of the ones that are easy to grow, that stuff likes to nectar on, that, that we have at the farm. Um, you know, we, you know, we try and use 100% natives, but we don't, we, you know, there are some other things that we use just because they're a good nectar source, but we grow them from seed and we make sure there's not no neonics in them or anything. One of the other things, it's not, um, uh, it's not a part of Monarch Waste Station, but it's something that we always encourage people to do at their, at their butterfly garden is to have a fruit feeding station because there's a lot of our native species of butterflies that like to 
feed on rotting fruit, which sounds gross, but again, if it's your butterfly, that's what you do. So uh, if you've got like an old banana, instead of throwing it away, you know, I mean, I guess you should make banana bread or something better, but if you, rather than throwing it away, um, think about putting it out there in a little flat rock, and you'll be surprised at the kind of butterflies that come in. It's, it's actually, it's really cool to see, and, and uh, the, the fruit feeders uh, in Oklahoma are actually really spectacular butterflies, so you'll be surprised what you see there. Um, so Sandy let me use her slides. Uh, her, her backyard habitat, I don't even know how to describe it. Um, it is huge. It's probably like a third of the size of this room, all devoted to butterfly garden. And I think she's documented 92 different species of butterflies there. It is the most amazing butterfly garden I've ever seen. Any. I've seen a lot of them, and uh, it's the most amazing thing I've ever seen. It's, it's more amazing than anyone I've ever seen at an institution or a zoo. I mean, it's really that good. But she sent us some photos of the plants that she uses in hers so that you can see, again, how lovely these natives are. It's the American fall aster. Um, and the fall asters, again, are a really important one because they're blooming when the monarchs are coming through in the fall. Um, and they're also really pretty, uh, but uh, they're an important one to include in your mix. Uh, golden crown beard. We have cone flowers, of course. They're the classic, the echinacea, all sorts of, there's like uh, three or four different varieties, maybe five different varieties of uh, cone flowers of echinacea that are native to Oklahoma, which are all quite lovely. And we have Joe pie weed, which is another beautiful plant. And we've got Liatris, the blazing star, and it, we've got, I think, four or five, maybe more different species of natives uh, that you can get probably at grogs in different places to, and that's a fall bloomer, again, important for the migration. Got the Gallardia, lovely. And okay, so this is not a native Mexican sunflower, Tithonia, but it is an amazing nectar plant, and you can get the seeds off Amazon even. And, um, and so it just makes a nice, pretty pot of annuals, and it's pretty nice because it blooms all summer long. And man, it is the butterfly magnet. Um, we grew up for the first time last summer, and we couldn't believe it. There was just constantly stuff on it. So um, that's, and it was easy to grow too. So that's one to consider, even though it's not native. And uh, Greg's mist flower, which is also not a native one, but again, it, well, it's native, but not native to our part of Oklahoma. And it's an amazing butterfly support plant. So another one to consider. And Okay, so there's, this is in here for a reason. This is obviously not a native flower, uh, but what this is, it's, it's an eastern black swallowtail larva. Uh, and so we focus a lot in monarchs, I focus a lot in monarchs, but we need to remember to support the other, the other species of butterflies out there too. We've got a lot of wonderful species of uh, butterflies native here to Oklahoma, and the nectar plants support them, but they need host plants too. You can't forget the baby butterflies because without the host plants, you're not going to have, um, you know, you're not going to have butterflies. So uh, Sandy has a list of host plants for our different native species of butterflies here. Uh, this is one that uh, will also host on parsley and dill, uh, interestingly. And again, true stories from the field. I've had a lot of people tell me that they, they killed them because they didn't realize that they were actually uh, butterfly caterpillars. Uh, so it's kind of about just making peace with nature, you know, is you can give up part of your dill plant to the caterpillars, can't you really? Because, uh, because it makes a beautiful butterfly. So uh, online resources to find more information about how to support, uh, support butterflies through gardening and monarch way stations. Uh, monarch Watch, obviously, they, you also, as you, if you get more into the monarch thing, you might want to participate in the tagging program, which is very cool. So every year, uh, thousands and thousands and thousands of people um, tag monarchs, and they record the number and uh, the time and place of release, and then the butterflies are recovered down in Mexico, the ones that die. So, um, but, or when they die eventually back up. But so they get recovered, and so it's a way that people have learned exactly what's going on with the monarch migration. So tagging has been fun, and, uh, and so it's something that everybody can do, and then you can look up online to see if your tag's recovered. So that's kind of cool to know where your butterfly went. Um, Okies for Monarchs, which is a consortium of a lot of different organizations here in Oklahoma that are working together. Uh, some of them are here today. Um, 
we got a booth right here and uh, Tulsa Monarch Initiative too in, and uh, Monarchs of the Mountain. Uh, but if you go to the website, uh, that's a resource. It's a clearinghouse for all sorts of different things, uh, where to find native plants, where there are events, monarch meetups, all sorts of stuff. If you're trying to get more involved in monarch conservation locally, it's a great thing. And then uh, Monarch Joint Venture, which is the same thing but on a national basis. It's a consortium of a lot of organizations that have come together starting many years ago to try and help save the monarchs. So, they um, there, and then I also, this is from uh, Sandy Schwinn. These are some resources that she recommends um, for the plants and the butterflies. So, um, and she's very, very knowledgeable. So uh, some of those I've used uh, and some of them I haven't. So there we are. Um, so, and then last of all, if you wanna know more about what we're doing at the UG Butterfly Farm, you can go to our website and particularly if you want to learn more uh, about our Tribal Environmental Actions for Monarch project. Uh, we don't have enough time to go into that today, but over the last four years, we've had seven tribes come together in Oklahoma. Creek Nation, which is well represented here today. Uh, we've got Creek Nation, we've got Osage Nation, Eastern Shawnee, Miami, Seminole, Citizen Potawatomi, and Chickasaw have come together over the last four years and they have restored over, I think the number, the final tally was over 50,000 milkweeds to tribal lands. And then they have also grown out and replanted over 30,000 wildflowers. Um, and so with this, with the, with the team project, uh, it's, you know, they, they've created a seed bank. Um, they've learned how to become, you know, habitat restoration professionals. And it, it's really been an amazing, amazing thing to see how they've stepped up to try and do this. So not everybody in this room is a Native American, but everybody in this room has a tribe. And you know who your tribe is. And now that you know a little more about what needs to be done, it's really, it's up to you because we all have to take that back to where we, where we belong to our people and try and spread the word because Otherwise, we, we are going to lose these monarchs, we are going to lose these pollinators, and heaven forbid we're going to lose the ecosystems. And once they're gone, they are never, ever, ever coming back. So I hope you will join us, and thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, Jane. We're going to pass the mic to um, our booth goers, and then we're going to uh, take questions. Um, but thank you so much for such a great presentation. Hi, I'm Marcy Hawkins. I'm the Conservation and Education Director for the Tulsa Urban Wilderness Coalition, which was one of the members um, that went to a summit and formed the Oklahoma Monarch and Pollinators Collaborative. Now, that's a mouthful, so to remember how to find our website, just think Okies for Monarchs. But when you go to the website, you'll be able to find out where you can get plants, where the festivals are, um, what to plant in your region. There's just a wealth of information because all of these groups and the best minds in the state came together and formed committees and tried to get everything in one place. So I encourage you to use that. I encourage you to take a pledge, and if you do that and fill out this, or if you sign up for if you sign up for our newsletter, that would be great. But if you take a pledge to take an action, I'll give you some seeds and a cool little sticker. So, um, if you have any more questions about Okies for Monarchs, our director Mary Waller couldn't be here today, but I'm filling in for her, and I'll try to help you with that. Hi, my name is Mary Jackson. I'm with Tulsa Audubon Society. It's a local known for profit. I'm here to tell you all about our 26th annual Wildlife Habitat Garden Tour and Native Plant Sale. It's May 18th and May 19th. We have five gardens that you can come see. One of the gardens on the tour this year is Sandy Swins Garden. So the 90 species of butterflies that, she, that Jane was telling you about, you can come see all the native plants and various types of milkweeds that Sandy has in her yard. The cost for the garden tour is $6. And then plus then we also bring in all the native plant vendors to the yards. So once you see Sandy's yard, then you can go, go out and buy all the various types of milkweeds that you like and all the native plants, all the nectar plants for spring, summer, fall that bloom. And um, it's just one of five yards. We have information about the tour here. So you can come by afterwards and grab a little flyer. Plus, we also have the information up on our website, Tulsa Audubon Society, and it's also on our Facebook page. 
Allen Island, Tulsa Audubon Society, and Tulsa County Master Gardeners. Hope you pick up an orange flyer on Monarchs, Milkweeds, and More, a free event on May 11th. A lot of the exhibitors here will also be at that event. Dr. Ray Morantz will be giving four presentations, and he's just returned from Mexico seeing the overwintering monarchs. So please attend that event. There will also be a plant sale, a kid zone, a lot of fun things happening from 9 to 3, Central Park Hall at the Tulsa Fairgrounds. Thanks. Hi, everybody. I'm Taylor Malone, Program Director at Up With Trees. Thanks, Sustainable Tulsa, for having us today. We are in our final month of our seedling giveaway, so we do have some pollinator-friendly species with us today. We have Vitex, American Plum, Sand Plum. I also have a couple of volunteers with me today, Nancy and Keith Schenkel, who um, went through our Citizen Forester program and have a pollinator garden of their own at home and are really familiar with some pollinator-friendly um, alternatives for, um, why am I blanking on the word, instead of pesticides. So they can answer a lot of questions on that. We also have a sign up here if you want to get our monthly program email, which includes upcoming volunteer and education opportunities. And our office is just down the street. We have several other uh, seedling species if you're interested in looking at those. I'm Morgan with Full Sun Composting. Natalie couldn't be here today, um, but we partner with local businesses to pick up food scraps to create a local compost. Um, and then every Saturday, Full Sun is at the Cherry Street Farmer's Market and we sell compost there, as well as um, anyone can bring their food scraps from home and we'll accept those and compost those for you. So yeah. I'm Jay Ross and this is Rick Katarski from the Tulsa Zoo. Uh, I'm just gonna give you a brief We've got five pollinator plants here that we're gonna give away here in a second. It'll be first drawn, first choice. So we've got the Mexican sunflower that she was mentioning, so. Hi, um, just a quick show of hands. Who here has heard of the Crow Creek Meadow? A few of you, okay. And some of you work on the project, so that's not fair. Um, but anyway, the Crow Creek Meadow is a project that the city of Tulsa and a bunch of other organizations in town have worked together to convert three basically vacated lots that houses were on right off of Crow Creek. And uh, over the past few years, we've converted that into a natural Oklahoma meadow with tons and tons of wildflowers. It's a certified way station as well. But we're having a, an event there on uh, May the 10th from three to seven. So. We welcome you to come by and see what we've done. And if you want to see a, an example of a beautiful pollinator garden, then that's where you want to be. We'll have a plant specialist there and an invertebrate specialist to tell you about the plants and tell you about the uh, insects that are drawn to this garden. So it's at 33rd place. It's uh, If anyone knows where Torchy's Tacos is on Brookside, you just turn right and head west about a block and you can't miss it. Uh, we've we've uh, branded a sign that we've had up for a few years, but we've rebranded that with uh, new interpretive information talking about the meadow. So if you're just in the area, just drive by there and check it out. Thanks. And you have a whole bunch of waste stations at the zoo too, right, as examples? Yes, okay. <laughs> Hi there, um, I'm Ruth with Grog's Green Barn. We're over at 61st on Mingo, and we have a ton of host and nectar plants that you can check out, and just come by and smell the flowers with us, okay? Hello, my name is Dustin Jaggers. I'm the Community Involvement Coordinator with the City of Tulsa Stormwater Quality. Uh, we have an education program called Save Our Streams, where we educate citizens about ways that they can reduce the pollution through the storm drains and watersheds. And uh, there's a lot that we do, so I'd love for you to come by and talk to me about it, but I won't go over that right now. Well, you can see there is a ton of wonderful ways to get involved and learn more and more and, and help get milkweed throughout the community. So we have about five-ish minutes to take a few questions for Jane. Or, uh, so does anybody have a question for Jane? A uh, question that caught my eye was about um, having things planted where they're sheltered from the winds. It being Oklahoma, how does one accomplish that impossible feat? <laughs> well, I mean, okay, so that's not a hard and fast thing. I mean, it's just, okay, 
if given your choice between something that does not have a high, you know, because there's windier corners. Well, Oklahoma, okay, we know this wind comes from all directions. Normally, you know, but if you think about the west or the north, you know, where some more stuff is coming from or whatever, depending on your exposure. If you can just have it something where it's a little more blocked, it just gives them a little bit of help. Um, you know, it's, they, it's just all about conserving resources. And, uh, and so if they're not having to, you know, fight the wind, if you've ever watched a butterfly nectaring on a flower in the wind, um, which I have, <laughs> it's my job, but anyway, is, uh, you know, they have to really, 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 you know, beat those wings and use a lot of energy just to stabilize. And thinking again about the lack of resources and even the concept behind the way station program is this is a way station because the habitat is not there. These little oases are what's going to support them to make their way on the long journey. So um, if that's the only nectar source around and it's a long way to fly in between, you know, we'd rather them just try and conserve their energy. So you can plant different things, different tall plants, just shelter, uh, but no, you don't have to do a lean-to for them or something. Just it's something to kind of keep in mind. So that's anyway. All right, long answer. Yeah. Right there. I'll let her do that. How are butterflies tagged? Okay, that's that's a good question. It's not like cattle, so if that's what you're asking, no. Um, no, so what they do is this was something that was developed, uh, anyway, um, Fred Urquhart first started doing this way, way back in like the 50s, but they've gotten a lot better at it. It's a tiny, tiny, tiny little mylar tag, and it's got a number on it, and so you they're affixed to the little four wing there um, and they give you directions for doing it and it does not hurt the butterfly um, and so when you order the tags from Monarch Watch uh, their numbers are recorded so uh, anyway you catch the butterflies on the migration when they're coming through it does not hurt them uh, the tag goes there on the little hind wing on the little spot they give you the directions how to do it and it's just gently affixed there it's 3M high tech glue and the mylar tag is so lightweight it, it doesn't add any weight to the journey so um, or negligible weight uh, and then you write down the tagging the number on the tag your name uh, if it was a male or a female butterfly, when you released it, where you released it, you know, ideally what the weather conditions were, and then that information goes to Monarch Watch, and they have, what is it, like over a million tags now in their database. Uh, not of all those have been recovered, but a lot get recovered. Uh, so they work with people down in Mexico, and this is an additional income source for people that are down at the biosphere at the preserve. And so the people, the locals, go in there, and these are indigenous people down there, and so they find the butterflies that have died that have a tag, and then um, and then Monarch Watch goes down, and they buy, ba buy them back for, like, whatever. It, I think the going rate is, like, five bucks a tag or something. And so then we know... Um, for instance, if you released your butterfly in Ada, Oklahoma on whatever, September 16th, that it made it all the way to Mexico. Um, so, so the really interesting part of this is that Dr. Chip Taylor is right now on a huge project to really analyze all this backlog of all this tagging data. And the things that he is finding out from doing this are really, really fascinating because so much with monarchs is speculative. We see them flying around, but with the tagging data, it's, it's irrefutable. We know, um, for instance, that if, you know, whatever, 2% of the butterflies that are tagged in Iowa are making it versus you've got um, the ones being tagged up in Massachusetts, you know, not so much, um, then we know, okay, then those are disproportionately, you know, different ge geographic areas have a higher uh, probability of making it down there. Butterflies that leave at different times have different probabilities of making it there. Um, you know, bigger butterflies, smaller butterflies. Anyway, it's, it's really, it's fascinating stuff. So it's an important part of being a citizen scientist. And, uh, and so that's so much with monarchs has come from citizen science. Um, and so it's just, it's a neat thing that anybody can do and particularly really good for kids too, um, to be able to learn. So that was maybe more than you wanted to know. I think you probably just wanted to know it was like a cattle tag, but anyway, there you go. Now, okay, thank you. We have time for one more quick question and that's that gentleman there. I remember <clears throat> learning at one point that banana peels are treated with a powerful pesticide on the outside. So you never wanted to, a person would never want to eat a banana peel anyway. Right. Should if you, for, for our fruit mm -hmm. uh, uh, butterflies, fruit feeders, yeah. mm -hmm. pollinators, yeah. should you then separate that fruit from the milkweed so that as they decompose, that pesticide doesn't infect the rest of your garden? 
So we have not seen problems with that. I mean, we generally try and use organic, like organic bananas, if we're going to be doing that. Um, but we have not seen problems with that, uh, like we have with other things. I think if you were composting, it would probably be fine. Um, you know, some of it has to do with uh, how quickly those pesticides break down. And, you know, while, you know, in general, pesticides not good. Uh, some of them do break down more quickly than others. The neonics are, again, what we've seen so much problem with because uh, we even have like friends that are butterfly farmers who they ran short on host food for their host plant for their butterflies, went to the, um, went to the nursery, they swore it wasn't treated, they put it in with their butterflies, everything's dead in 24 hours. So um, we've heard stories like that over and over and over again from people. So you just, you just have to be really careful with it. Um, and we had a problem at the farm with drift from people spraying uh, pecan trees um, kind of in the area and everything came in and just the drift was enough to kill all of ours. But the bananas, I don't, as far as I know, and we use them a lot, we've never seen everything die from the bananas. So yeah, anyway, it's a good question though. Do we have any more questions? Are we out of time? I don't know. I, we don't have much more time. We're gonna do the giveaway really okay, quickly. Right. And then we also, um, I'll meet you in the back if you would like to take one milkweed plant with you today. It is with the promise that you will plant it. <laughs> so uh, we're going to uh, draw names really quickly. So thank you, Tulsa Zoo, for providing our giveaways today. Uh, and oh, my name is Megan Hurley. <laughs> Corey introduced me a little bit earlier. So first one up is Michael Patton. Yay. Yay. <laughs> Donald Pugh. So, yay, perfect. We have three more. Keith Taylor. Keith, you here? Yay, perfect. Come on, ladies. <laughs> All right, let's see. Todd Ray. Todd? Yay. One more. And Aaron Larder. Yay. All right. Thank you guys so much. I'll meet you back at this table. Thank you all for coming today. We really appreciate it.